my part of the city is quite special because it used to actually be a village neighboring Zagreb and not actually part of Zagreb. So you still have Ooh. the, you know, the village vibes and, you know, the soft little plains and the vineyards and people still yeah. have, you know, livestock and animals and stuff like that. that p- putting that in mind that, you know, we are free to be challengers yeah. while they are never free from this mental pressure if, because of their yeah. privilege is something that really stuck with me over time. 2018 euros, I make open semis and ESL finals. And then six months after that, I'm in the finals of Worlds. It was just a huge jump. There wasn't any real progression. Yeah. Hi everyone, Uh, welcome to another episode of the Shaft Podcast. My name is Andrews and I'll be your host for today. Um, On the Shaft Podcast, we have several conversations. We discuss issues with the world's most prominent debaters. Um, We talk about sports occasionally on the Beer Parlor episodes and occasionally we also come your way with intriguing one-on-one episodes. So today we are here to have a one-on-one interview with one of the world's very best debaters and we would get in a lot about about um, him in a bit. But just to note, this episode would really be a very good conversation because this individual has been known to be a serial winner, the hunger to defy the odds, to set the standards, and to, to de- basically determine the trends of, of world debating in the recent years have become a thing that you cannot discuss without mentioning um, this individual's name. And so on this episode, we would have a one-on-one in-depth conversation with Tim Pulich, um, who is here with me today. So, Tim, welcome to this episode of the Shaft Podcast. Thank you, Andrews. Yeah. Um, just just to set the ball rolling, how are you feeling today? Um, how is Croatia like? How is the weather? How are things going? I'm feeling very nice, actually. We're having quite sunny weather today. It's very warm, so summer is coming. I'm actually yeah. sitting here in a beer garden talking to you because the weather is so <laughs> nice. I could not, you know, I could not bear to be inside. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's really, really yeah. nice here. I'm, I'm feeling the summer vibes. That's amazing. I mean, I saw on somebody's status today talking about how in the UK, summer barely appears. It seems like they are missing out a lot with, with how excited you are about, about the summer approaching as well. Yeah. Um, so just to give you as a heads up, we'll be having three blocks of conversations. Um, the first part, we'll just talk through 10 questions. In fact, I had one last question just not long ago. So there will be an 11th question. 11 questions that viewers won't tend to answer. Um, and then we'll walk through the second part where we talk a lot more about debating. And then the final part, just go a little bit more personal with you um, rising to the top of debating and a, a few personal things around you. So let's just get to the first 11 questions. The first one is to, for me to ask you, what are your favorite childhood memories? So I think it's relatively hard to pick just a few um, I think it would probably be, you know, the, the carelessness because I, I live in a part of a town that's quite secluded. It looks more of like a village than a town. So it's a very, you know, tight knit local community and stuff like that. So I guess some of my favorite memories were like, you know, just finishing school in the afternoon, having no homework, going to the local, yeah. you know, football field to play football, to play basketball, or just when, you know, the summer holidays come and then you spend all summer playing video games or going, you know, um, going to the seaside, going swimming, like, you know, the basic carefree child stuff. Um, yeah. I think those would be my fondest memories. Like nothing special in particular, just the, the you know track record of having year after year of just being a kid doing kid stuff. I guess. <laughs> do you miss the, Do you miss those days though? Oh yeah, a- adulting is hard and very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Um, second question is, what is the best part of upbringing in Croatia? <clears throat> Again, I think it's very hard to to pick just one i would say yeah first of all it's a very beautiful country um okay. we have different types of you know terrain we have plains we have mountains we have the seaside and then i think just traveling is very accessible to you growing up like you can just go sit in a car and in two hours you're going to be at the seaside or you go two oh. hours eastward you're going to be you know rolling plains and sunshine and stuff like that so there's a lot of things you can just see within one country um i think secondly it's just the culture uh, people are very uh, friendly. 
the communities, neighborhoods are very tight knit, very close knit. You feel welcome. You never feel like you know drowned out within within the community that you're growing up in. But I think yeah. the third thing is, and I guess you're going to be getting to that later. Um, but I think it's also the fact we're a sports nation, and when you're a yeah. kid, you're just so excited about everything related to sport because everyone around you is excited. Just you know, yeah. getting to, to feel the atmosphere of the of the football and the handball and the water polo mm-hmm. and all the stuff we do quite well as a kid, I think left an impression on me uh, growing up. Yeah, that's that's quite intriguing, especially the sports part. It's very relatable because back in Ghana, sports is a big thing when it's nearing the African Cup of Nations or the World Cup. Almost every national news is on hold. Everything is now sports, which which gives the vibes that you're talking about. I think this third question is probably similar to the one you just answered, which wants me to ask you to describe the city of Zagreb, probably much more specific this time, and what you love about it. So the city is quite interesting. There's a thing that combines different aesthetics and different visuals from different parts yeah. of history. So the city center is very, you know, medieval, nice churches, nice little buildings, cobblestone roads and stuff like that, uh, you know, oh. gas lanterns and all that kind of stuff. When you move away from the city center, it's more like early 20th century type architecture. And then when you move even further away from the center, it's mostly socialist, communist building blocks because we were part of Yugoslavia. Um, oh, so okay. there's a lot of different <clears throat> visuals you can see. <clears throat> My part of the city is quite special because it used to actually be a village neighboring Zagreb and not actually part of Zagreb. So you still have oh. the, you know, the village vibes and, you know, the soft little plains and the vineyards and people still yeah. have, you know, livestock and animals and stuff like that. So I think that's one thing. I think the second thing is the city is very green. So I think it's one of the greenest cities in Europe in terms of how many parks it has, how many green space it has, how many trees it has, like, you know, have long alleys with trees on both sides of the, the street and stuff like that. But what I really like about it, apart from the aesthetics, the visuals, which I'm enjoying right now because I'm literally in the city center, uh, yeah. I think is that it's just big enough that you can find everything you need. So you're never bored. There's always something to do. There's always concerts. There's clubs. There's cafes. There's bars. There's sports events. So whatever you're interested in, you can find. But it's still small enough that you don't feel devoured by the city. Because I remember going, okay. for example, to New York and I felt really... Um, I felt literally being swollen alive by how big it is and even oh. if you go to like central park if you look up you're surrounded by all the yeah. skyscrapers and it feels like you cannot escape from the city in zagreb it's very easy to escape from the city if you want something quieter there's so many nice terraces in the city mm-hmm. center there's so many nice parks there's so many you know green spaces nice little benches there's a lot of spaces where you can just go in be yourself and have a little bit of peace while still having yeah. the feel of the city where there's stuff to do yeah i mean this is such a beautiful description because it, it's more like in a world where almost everything is so fast paced, like you're really struggling to catch your breath, finding yourself in such a place where you could just find a small space where you could escape from all the fast moving things that are all around you. It's, it's really, really cool. Um, the next question is how deep is your support for Dinamo Zagreb and how passionate are you about football? I would say it's very, very deep. So I started supporting them when I was still in primary school. So it's almost 20 years watching them by now. Um, I really try not to miss a game when, regardless of where I am. So we were at VNIV like two weeks ago and everybody was going to the Eurovision socials and I stayed alone in my room to watch the Dinamo Zagreb game because it was, you know, the the crucial game for the championship. Like if we win, we will, we will win the title and stuff like that. I also, I also go to the stadium whenever I can. So this weekend I'm going because we're having the title celebration. It's the, we we, we secured the title like a couple, couple rounds ago, but like, yeah, this is the last round. There's going to be the title celebration. There's going to be a concert in the main square. I'm going to go to all that and I'm going alone because the friend I usually go with, he's away from from the city. But like, even if I'm going alone, I won't, I won't miss it. It's yeah. a very, very important thing to me. I don't, I don't miss games. So if you ask Zagreb debaters, like we have trainings on Wednesday evening and yeah. I tell them at the beginning of the season, uh, we always have training, except if it's a national holiday or if Dinamo is playing. If Dinamo is playing, somebody else is doing the training. <laughs> I'm sorry, like this, this is my priority. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's really cool. Also, um, I think myself and Erasmus started the beer parlor recently. We just started discussing football stuff. And it was shocking how many debaters loved football in varying ways and were interacting with it. Because it felt like, oh, debaters, when you meet them in 
debate spaces are sort of nerdy, antisocial, not really into sport that much. And so I listened to one of your speeches, I think it was about football, where you were talking about um, Croatia, the national team, Luka Modric, the Ballon d'Or, and I realized how passionate you are about, about Dinamo Zagreb and, then, and the, the Croatian national team as well. But who is your favorite player? Who do you think, if you are to pick amongst um, footballers that have come from Croatia, who do you pick? Okay, so I think objectively the best player is probably Luka Modric. I think there's no, yeah. no discussion about that. Like so, so, so many criteria, like titles won, the fact that he's 38 and still able to play at the highest level, um, yeah. the fact that it was under his captaincy that we won second place and third place of the World Cup. Um, yeah. But if I were to pick subjectively, um, I would say Misla Vosic. He's a former Dynamo player. Okay. Uh, he played like five seasons for us. He scored a hat trick against Tottenham, hat trick against Atalanta, <laughs> so many important goals. He also assisted yeah. our equalizing goal against Brazil in the quarters. Uh, so he's my favorite Dinamo Zagreb player of all time. So if I would have to pick subjectively, I would say Misla Vosic. So if you watch the, if you watch the uh, world's final when Lovren and I won Korea, yeah, he's wearing the Croatian football jersey and I'm wearing the blue Dinamo jersey. Uh, the player, the player on the, the player on the on the shirt is is in fact Vosic, and it's a shirt with his quote, which says. Uh, there is no bigger club than Dinamo. Wow, this is this is interesting. I mean, the next question also relates to football, but it's more debate related. Which wants to ask, how do you relate football and other sports to the activities of debating? Yeah, okay. So I think there's a bunch of stuff. I think first is just the basic thing that debating is kind of like a sport to the extent which it's competitive and quantifiable, and there's continental competitions and intercontinental competitions. There's a lot of yeah. things that we do on a baseline level can be equated with, with sports. I think the second thing is you can get a lot of motivation from watching your favorite sports people, especially if you're the underdog, like as Croatia or as Dinamo. We're always the underdog, so we're a very small country. Yeah. We're a new country. So you, can, you you just watch all of those people succeed in doing things that you did not think were possible, like you know, making the World Cup final. And then you're like, okay, if they can do it, I can do it because we come from a similar underdog position. But lastly, I think there's just a lot you can learn. So I think a lot of my coaching philosophy comes from football. I really like to watch interviews with football coaches, to listen to their perspective of the game, their perspective of tactics, their perspective of man management, because I think a lot of that can be translated into debating. Like Different styles of debating can be analogized yeah. to different styles of football. Different types of psychologically approaching your players if you're a manager can also help you as a debating coach and stuff like yeah. that. So literally this, this summer when I was discussing with Zagreb D at Euros, I was Petan and Mislav. We were discussing, you know, in football, I really like this, the, the gag and pressing type of football, you know, constant yeah. pressing. What is the analogy to gag and pressing in debating? How do you do gag and pressing? And then we discussed, okay, it's probably if you do constant weighing, if for every point that you have, every argument that you have, you include, you know, all of these micro weighings, there's always this explanation. Here is why this matters. Here, here is why it matters, even if the other side proves their case to an extent. And if you constantly put the pressure on the other team, that you have to counterweigh everything you weighed because you did so much microweighing, that would be yeah. like the debating analogy of, you know, gag and pressing. And I think in a lot of my de debate coaching philosophy, I try to think in this way. When I look at football tactics, the part of football tactics that I like, how do I translate those into debate? Yeah, that's, that's really intriguing and very fascinating as well because I like football as well. I enjoy all the tactical analysis of football, but I, I don't... I'm unable to translate it from football to debate. And just listening to you do gengen pressing to microwave, it's just like a light bulb moment. It's like, oh, this is interesting. I spend yeah, far really, too much really time cool. thinking about these things. <laughs> but it's really cool. It's, it's really, really cool, honestly. Yeah, the next question from the audience is the famous tin scarf. I think a lot of us have seen it. Um, for I actually noticed that when I went back to watch some HWS videos and then I realized that that scarf wasn't just the initial times when I saw you, but it had been there for a very long time. And the question here is, what did it mean to you from the start? And eventually, what did it evolve to mean to you? So the first appearance of the scarf was in, at Cape Town World 2019. Yeah. At that point, it was a purely... I would say mostly a purely footballing, uh, how do you say, expression. Because both Lover yeah. and I are big Dynamo fans and we wanted to you know, express it on a global stage. Especially when you're so far away from home. Like you're on a different yeah. continent. You're literally, you know, the only thing that's more sought from you is Antarctica. Like it kind of helps to have some sort of memorabilia that reminds you of, you know, of home. Uh, yeah. But I think when we did that, it was just a purely 
local patriotic slash patriotic sporting type of expression. But what happened over time is that because we were the trailblazers in the community, like we were the first ones to get an open break, we then started to be coaches in Zagreb. We built up a lot of debaters. We built up a community. Yeah. People began to see the scarf as a symbol of Zagreb debating. And a lot of people who wear the scarf today aren't really fans of football. And they don't know yeah. that much about the football, but they see yeah. the scarf as a symbol of Zagreb debating. So I think over time yeah. it's evolved to be not just a symbol of the club, but a symbol of our community and i think that's why it's very very emotional for me when i see you know younger debaters wear the scarf regardless of whether they like football or not because to me it's a sign of how we have you know built up a community generation by generation who still you know takes to the tradition who still appreciates how the community started and all of that kind of stuff yeah i mean it's it i didn't even know it was a dinamo zagreb flag i genuinely just know it as the famous tin scarf and and now it's it also confirms just what you are saying that like a lot of people relate to it not even because of its original identity but because of what we've come to know it as a representation of your debating legacy your achievements and and the trajectory that you've taken the next question for you is what was your favorite partnership i mean debate partnership and why <clears throat> I mean, obviously, it has to be Lovro, right? Because, yeah. I mean, first of all, because of all the results we had together, I think just in terms of titles won, it has to be yeah. the best. But I think I also just enjoyed debating with him. It was a very nice experience. We became close friends over those years. I think traveling with him was a very nice experience, whether it was to yeah. Worlds or to Euros. We've remained friends afterwards. Um, and I always ha have a nice time reminiscing, not just what we've won and what we've done, but also the nice times we had while doing it. Um, yeah. I think if I were to exclude Lovro, um, I think it would be harder to choose them because I've had many different partnerships with people. I think it would probably be Dylan McCarthy. Yeah. Um, I think Dylan is the only person with whom I've done more than one tournament and won everything. Um, yeah. I think we yeah. understand each other very well because we, we, we both have a liking for principles. We both have a liking for philosophy and political theory. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we just... The, the different types of crazy combined very well into good cases. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, I've I've seen the two of you at a couple of competitions, and it wasn't a good experience for me. So, I'm not I'm not a fan of you two partnering up together. But I I get that it's a good partnership, and it's it's a really most likely an enjoyable one as well. Um, the next question for you is who is Tin? And this person wants to know not about what you do but about who you are? <laughs> That's a very hard question to answer. Um, yeah. Because I don't know exactly what, what part of my identity the, the, the question is getting at. Um, I guess if I, were, if I were to define myself, I place a lot of value in friendships. Yeah. I really enjoy having a lot of people as my friends, having a diverse community around me, going out with people, you know, having a couple of beers, spending time together with people who I love. I feel very, very bad if I spend the entire day at home. Every day I try, oh. no matter how busy no matter how busy I am, or if I have an exam the day after, or if, I, if I'm busy with work, I always try to have at least a couple of hours, you know, to go out of my house, see somebody I like, see a friend, you know, keep up the, the connection. Um, so so I, really, I really place a lot of value in interpersonal connections. Um, I think I'm also a person who really loves his city and his country. Um, I don't think I could ever leave. Uh, I never did. I had opportunities to go abroad for, for college. I think I would have gotten yeah. into some pretty good colleges with my CV. I just never wanted to. I, I like it here. I like the memories I have here. I like the way the city looks. I like the people. I like the country. Uh, so I guess I'm very tied to where I'm from and yeah. the community I'm from, not necessarily on a nationalist level, but rather just on a level of appreciating your roots and appreciating where you've grown up and the memories you've built there. I think that's also a very important part of my identity. I am also fundamentally a debater. I don't think I'll ever be able to <laughs> fully, you know, fully divest from debating. I think even yeah. when I'm, you know, over 30, at least I'm still going to go to Worlds because it's a free holiday and stuff like that. You get to see people you haven't seen. Yeah. Before. I'm going to be like Harish, you know, never ne never quitting debating, really. Um, yeah, so, so I guess those are the most important elements of who I am. I think if the question were somewhat more specific, I could go into more depth, but like yeah. this one comes, comes to mind first, so that's like the most natural answer. 
Yeah. And I think it's also a very unique answer because a lot of the time, probably because I, I, I also found the question a bit weird at first, but I also get the fact that when people are asked who they are, a lot of us tend to default to what we do rather than trying to answer in different ways. And like you said, it's probably a difficult question to ask because it's not highlighting any specific elements of your identity for you. The next question is quite interesting. It says, are you a person moved by motivation? And if you are, what is the best motivational quote that you've seen out there? Hmm. Can you repeat the second part of the question? If you are a person moved by motivation, then what is the best motivational quote you've seen or you've heard? Mm, a lot. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, okay, I, I definitely am a motivation-driven person. I think in order to be good at anything, you need to be motivated. Because whatever you do, there's always going to be you know, things will go badly. There's going to be bad yeah. luck. It's going to take a lot of time for you to get good in something. And even if you are good in something, um, something's going to go wrong. You're going to get sick. Somebody's going to piss you off. There's always so many yeah. variables that can make something go wrong for you. And the only way you can persist to actually get better and, or to be one of the best um, is to be motivated. So, I, I, yeah, I'm, I am motivation-driven. I think for me, the biggest motivation was the idea of succeeding despite all odds. Yeah. The idea of coming from a small community not really having any VP coaching, not having nearly as, as much resources as people from Iona do or people from North America do, uh, having yeah. the ESL barrier, being from an institution that doesn't really have much reputation. And despite all that, you know, slowly building up, building up, building up and getting to where I am, I think yeah. what, was what was driving me, just the idea of tearing down the barriers. Right? I think it would have been a lot harder for me if I were from a privileged institution because then I feel it's always as if you have to prove why you're there in the first place. Oh. Because everybody's going to be like, you're so privileged. Like if you're from Oxford, you have you no know, Slavoj Žižek and Jordan Peterson and people like that speaking at the Oxford Union every you know, Friday. So yeah. how are you not good enough? Um, so I guess it would have been a lot harder for me in that situation. And I think from that context, I would perhaps give one motivational quote which, which stuck with me um, in debating at least. Uh, and this yeah. was way back in the day when, when I was still more or less a novice. I remember Milos. He wasn't actually talking to me. He was talking to Roman, but I was listening in on the conversation. And yeah. Milos told him something along the lines of, when you come from where we come, you have nothing to lose when you're going against the best of the best. You have nothing to prove. They are the ones yeah. who should be afraid because they have to justify themselves if they lose to you. So if you're coming from yeah. your Sofia C or Zagreb B, if you lose to Harvard Day, like nobody's going to ask you why you lost to Harvard Day, but if Harvard Day loses to you, then they have to justify why they lost to these random people from the from the Balkans. And you know, just that, putting that in mind that you know we are free to be challengers, yeah. while they are never free from this mental pressure if, because of their yeah. privilege, is something that really stuck with me over time. That is really interesting. It's more like a flip way of looking at the, the statuses and trying to break a mental limitation that we have knowing that or thinking that we are the ones that are as underdogs rather with the restriction but then this quote just tells you you actually have all the freedom in the world challenge with all your grits and then they have to defend the best ways they can really really cool stuff um the next one i think is similar to the one you've just answered which is what is or what are the principles that guide you in life and why did you choose those specific principles? I think the first principle would be never compromise on things that make you happy. Okay. I don't believe in people <clears throat> sacrificing genuine you know, environments that make them feel comfortable just because of some societal expectation that they should succeed or push for something more. I've had so many people ask me why I never went to college abroad. I had so many people tell me I've chosen the wrong career or that it wasted my opportunities. But it just yeah. doesn't make sense. I could go to a good college abroad. I could land a good consulting job abroad. But if I'm not happy with where I live, if I'm not happy with the environment that surrounds me, then it just doesn't make sense. I don't believe in life led, lived just for success if you don't enjoy that success. And I deeply believe it's fair for people to realize that they have potential and to normally yeah. say, I don't want to realize my potential, or I don't want to realize it in this particular way, because that's make yeah. me happy. So I would just say, my principle is, pick the job that you like, pick the college that you like, pick the country that you like, even if it means less money, even if it means more sacrifice, even if other people will judge you for it. I think for the things that you do care about in life, 
I think my principles yeah. always keep trying. And it sounds very much cliche, like, haha, always keep trying. But it does make sense because for most things that people do, you do progressively get better just yeah. by trying and just by going yeah. at it, going at it. Like, there were some junctions in my debating career where I thought I would quit debating. That was before I even broke a, a major. If I hadn't yeah. kept going, I would never have done anything in this in this activity. And just by keeping going and you know, losing and learning and losing and learning, I learned a lot of stuff. But I think it's also just about how you perceive yourself within the framework of a particular activity. I'm always angry at my debaters when they see themselves, you know, in the, on the draw, in the top room, and they're like, oh my God, now we're going to take the fourth. Or, you know, when people go into the top room and they say, oh, I'm so grateful to be in this room with such good debaters, you're basically conceding defeat. Like, it's not a problem to lose, but it's a problem to have yeah. lost in your head before you even before you even tried to do something. And it applies not just to yeah. debaters, but anything in life. You can fail. It is okay to fail. But don't con convince yourself that you failed before you've even tried. Because then you just, you know, damned yourself to, to not being not being successful. I think the last principle would be always surround yourself with people that you love to the extent to which you can. I think a life lived alone is a very sad life. I don't enjoy knowledge. I don't enjoy fun facts. I don't enjoy uh, food or drink. I don't enjoy all of these basic human things if there's nobody to share it with. Yeah. Ultimately, though, it's fine to spend some time alone and all people need that. We are social creatures. And if you cannot yeah. share the, the, you know, basic stuff in life with other people, I just don't think it makes a lot of sense. Really, really interesting. That's those are really cool principles. I'm I'm picking a few of them for myself. Uh, and then the final question in this part is: Did you ever feel like after winning worlds you had to start again? And if you did, how did you deal with that feeling? Um, I think this question is coming from the source of people feeling after winning the penultimate. It's like ah. Uh, maybe I'm still not satisfied or maybe I'm still not fulfilled. Did you feel fulfilled and enough that like you've done enough after winning Worlds? Yeah, so I I did still after winning Worlds, I did do tournaments at yeah. point at times just for the fact that, you know, I still don't have this particular thing on my CV and would be yeah. cool to add it. Like, you know, I've never won Cambridge, so let's go win Cambridge and stuff like that. But after having won Worlds, it was never a pressure after winning Worlds, it just became, you know, I can just trophy hunt at this point. So I've done the main yeah. thing, right? I've, it's like when you're playing a video game and you completed, you know, the main the main story arc. You've completed yeah. the main quest. You've, you're done with the campaign. And now you can just do all of the side quests. Uh, yeah. It's like a side quest now. I can just add nice little things to my CV. But I don't feel deeply unfulfilled or deeply doubtful of myself if I don't because I know I've done the I've done the big thing. So I, I've, I've won yeah. what I wanted to win and I've won the biggest trophy there is. Um, there isn't debating. So I would say I still want to speak. I'm still ambition driven. I still think there's things to do, but I don't feel anymore as if I have to speak just for the sake of winning trophies, which I think to some extent before world, there was this pressure off. I don't want to retire before having won a major in the open category. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, thank you. So this has been the first part of the interview with Tim Poolidge. Um, we had 11 amazing questions from our viewers. We'll be back with the next part where we talk a little bit much more in depth into debating a few philosophies and a few experiences from there. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back. So in this episode, we've been having a discussion with Tin Poolidge. Um, in the first part, Tin answered 11 key questions from our audience. Some really intriguing answers as well, which definitely you would love um, if you've listened up to this point. In this second part, we'll be discussing debate and the growth um, within the debate space. Before you continue listening, do well to subscribe, like the episode, leave your comments and your thoughts about the first part as well, and some of the intriguing answers that you heard, and definitely join us on the journey to the second part. And so when you look back, Tin, on when you started debating and where you are now, how do you feel and how do you feel the version of you back then would see the version of you now? And, and what are some of the things that you think that the old you will tell your new self? Um, I think the old me would not believe that the new me has done what the new me has done. Because um, yeah. when I started VP, so I was just, I was fresh out of high school. I did world schools in high school. 
uh, yeah. for the Croatian World Schools community was really underdeveloped at the time, not in the sense of not having a lot of people or in the sense of having infrastructure, but our yeah. perception of World Schools wasn't really aligned with what international world schools is. And I would care to say that to some extent it still isn't fully, but back then yeah. there was a lot more dependency. We basically had no BP community at all. Um, it's just going to BP tournaments was, you know, you go, you lose, you don't understand why you lost because you have this world schools mentality. And stuff yeah. like this. You begin to blame the format, you blame the judges instead of blaming yourself. It's, you know, it's a self, self-growth moment. And in 2016, I was very, very close to quitting debating. I, I, actually, I actually made the decision in my head to quit. I just went to do one last tournament with my partner back then in Belgrade because I promised him we'd yeah. win. And like, in a weird twist of fate, we won the tournament. Uh, and then I was like, well, maybe maybe this is you know a message, <laughs> some metaphysical message that I should I should keep going. <laughs> yeah. And then having kept going, there were more pitfalls along the way. I didn't br- I didn't break a talent year in 2017. I had even less points than I had in 2016. Um, but I still kept going. I was like, okay, I, I'll give it one final shot with Lodra, and then it paid off. So I guess I just will default what is said in, in the answer to the last question, the first bit, which is, I think from this perspective, I would tell my old self to just keep trying and, you know, believe me, it will work. I know it sounds unbelievable. It sounds even impossible, but it, it will work at one point. Yeah. You just need to keep yeah. trying. And this, this story just fits really well with why that is one of my guiding principles. Yeah. 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 Really true. And I think it also fits well into this, the next question, which is about consistency and growth. You've been talking about the idea that you should just keep trying regardless of how difficult it seems. And so, the next question is, how valuable was consistency in your rise to the top? Because I, I know a lot of people who either at some point stop trying or try on different occasions, and so it is not consistent enough to generate any meaningful impact. Um, and there have been questions about, is it fair or is it even necessary to be consistent, especially if you're an underdog and you're trying to break into the space? It's important to consistently keep working. Different people have different styles of work and of training which suit them. Some people yeah. benefit a lot from you know the MDG method of 1 p.m. every day. Some people don't. Some people learn a lot more at tournaments. Others learn a lot more at drills in their you know, yeah. debating club, their debating community. Um, some people have different types of notes that the note taking that you know benefit them or don't benefit. So obviously, trying to get good is an exercise in. Uh, trying and failing, you know, trial and error. Uh, yeah. So in, in terms of whether you try out different things, of course you should. Like if one thing isn't working for you, you seek the advice of your coaches, you listen to judges' feedback, you try different things. Uh, but it's important to keep trying regardless of how many times you have to switch around. And also it's important to give change a time to kick in. So one of the things yeah. that I learned from Dan Lahav is that the big problem is when people try to change something in their debates. For example, your note-taking is not working and you're trying a new style of note-taking. If you're speaking a 78 average now, when you switch to the new notes, you will, at least for the first few months, you'll be speaking a 77 because you haven't yeah. adjusted to the new notes. That doesn't mean it's a bad note-taking style. If you stick with it, yeah. it can turn out to be better for you than the old one, but it's just because you're going out of your comfort zone. You know, you have to be prepared when you're you know, implementing some kind of change new exercise, new focus and training. But in the short term, it's going to hurt your results. And you need to be prepared to sacrifice results and your comfort with those results to get better results in the in the long term. So, of course, you know, yeah. try different things, give ch- chance, uh, give, you know, uh, change a chance, but keep trying at those different things. And if it doesn't work, try it five times, six times, seven times. At one point, you're bound to at least accidentally stumble into something that works for you. Yeah. Yeah. And this is quite an intriguing intriguing take on on trying out new things and giving success time. Because it's more like what you're saying is when you try out new things, be prepared to experience a little bit bad results, even much worse than where you were before. And then you are going to kick in. I think maybe applying this to some experiences in the past. Myself and Erasmus, we've tried a lot of things. And always we tell ourselves, we, we tried this thing, we learned this thing way back, it never worked. Maybe a year down the line, we are speaking and we realize, oh, finally, seems like we are getting good at it, right? And back then, we almost felt like it wasn't, it wasn't working, it was unnecessary. And like you said, we were trying things in the moment and expecting it to quickly kick in within those moments, which is sometimes just an unrealistic thing to be, to be doing to yourself. 
Also, you just spoke about this as well, but how did you measure your progress to make sure you avoided undue pressure on yourself um, during your growth phase? Because a lot of us tend to place this pressure on ourselves. You enter a tournament, we think winning is the only measurement of progress. You go to Worlds as an underdog, and sometimes you think breaking or doing better than you did before is the only way to measure progress. And anything less than setting high standards in our minds is less of progress. Did you experience those challenges as well? And how did you adjust to measuring your progress in ways that took away certain undue pressures from you? So for me personally, I think the story was a bit unconventional. Um, because in uh, my first world was Cape Town. And oh. so the story goes like this. So 2016 Euros, I am i don't break ESL on speaks. 2017 yeah. Euros, I, I'm on 14. I'm not even close to the break. 2018 Euros, I make open semis and ESL finals. And then okay. six months after that, I'm in the finals of Worlds. It was just a huge jump. There wasn't any real Massively. progression. Yeah. <laughs> there wasn't any real progression to measure. Uh, but I think what... What I could give as advice to people, I think if you want to measure your progress, if you want to quantify it in a way, in rounds are a lot better at doing that than yeah. out rounds. Because in rounds measure your ability to speak consistently across different judges, different positions, different motions, um, yeah. different you know type, times of day, if nothing else. Some people perform better in the morning, I guess, whatever. But like, there's a lot more variables, a lot more data yeah. that you have from in rounds than from out rounds where... It very often, whether you make the quarters or semis, just comes down to whether you are CG on a shallow up heavy motion, you know. Yeah. It's, it's too arbitrary. Yeah, yeah. That is fair. And I think it's true. I personally hate the third round of every every comp. I think at Belgrade Worlds, for instance, I couldn't even stand the second round. And it was just a two-round tournament, two-round a day tournament, and I was really struggling with it. So for me, for instance, I tend to like early morning within the early part of the day. Later parts, I'm exhausted already. My mind is fried at some point. Next set of questions for you. How or what are the best ways to evaluate your growth as a debater in becoming a great speaker? I think this, you mentioned that you weren't really evaluating the growth um, from your perspective because of the leaps that came in. But in terms of somebody who just wants to improve their speech style, because you, I don't know how to describe you and your speech style. Probably one of the most electric and phenomenal I've seen in a very long time. You combine both the strengths of, you see this thing where we say as ESL speakers, our strength is not speed. Our strength is maybe framing and taking our time to speak in a way that's audible to people. You combine this every single strength of ESL and combine the speed that EPL guys think they have and just blast it in everyone's face. And the speaks that you get in these speeches is usually just insane. Because sometimes I listen to your speeches and I'm like, how do you do this? I can't copy you. I can't imitate you because I can't speak as fast as you do. But it's really, really incredible the kind of speeches that you give. And I just want to know here whether there are specific things you look out for in yourself as an individual on the path to discovering the best speech style for you. So I think first thing is... To do so, what you mentioned earlier with you and Erasmus, like, you know, looking back at you know the things we did a year ago and how we're doing at those things now, yeah, it's a lot of reflection on how you did, how well you performed in doing the same skills like a year ago or six months ago, can help you first of all track your progress in different skills, but also help you find out where you are progressing the fastest, which are your biggest okay. strengths. I think also speaking different positions, even if they're not natural to you, can help. So also, yeah. I do think I'm a natural first speaker. I spent most of high school speaking deputy. I spent the first couple of years in VP speaking deputy. A lot of the skills of integrating remodel and deputy, I just translated yeah. into leader of all, for example, or into oh. member of all, member of all. So trying out different things and different partnerships is also very useful because you learn a lot from different partners you speak with. And yeah. it's not the same if you just you know listen to Techway or listen to Hadar as yeah. opposed to being in prep with them and hearing how these people actually think. Um, yeah. So putting yourself in different roles, different positions, different partnerships, even if you're uncomfortable with those, can really, really help a lot with, with um, 
with your improvement. I think the self-reflection thing I mentioned is also important and it's also, I think, the clearest answer to your question of how do you mark your progress or how do you track yeah. it? I think just looking back at how well you did at certain things and comparing to now, I think what's also very important is to ask judges targeted feedback. So if you self-evaluate and you realize, okay, I'm not that good at rebuttal or I'm not that good at time management, it's important to ask judges specifically about those things. So how can I time manage better? With the content I've had, you know, what would you throw out? What would you maybe cut? What would you spend more time on? And then consistently ask for feedback on the same thing because then you get a pattern of feedback across months or across years on, on yeah. the same type of skill. And oh. you can engage with first what doesn't work for you. I think in terms of speaking styles, so you mentioned, you know, my style and whether you maybe you cannot copy my style and stuff like this it's dangerous to try to copy debaters that you like or that you've heard before you're sure what your own speaking style is i think yeah. the way it goes the, the, the roadmap is try to define for yourself what kind of speaker you are are you more of a matter dumper are you more of a you know down to earth chill kind of guy who explains things very on a very basic level are you very strong at framing do you enjoy rebuttal and then look for speakers that are similar to who you think you are and then yeah. look at how those speakers do the things you want to be doing well and then try to emulate that but until you define for yourself what kind of speaker you think you are or this kind of speaker you want to be it's dangerous to go into trying to copy somebody's style i could never copy lovro because yeah. just not the same type of speaker. I yeah. don't do that without point by point rebuttal. I'm not that, you know, this guy you sit for a beer with and you just explain this to you very down to earth. That's just not me. Um, so you guys come down to first realizing who you think you are and then trying to find speakers who do that very well and trying to emulate that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's that's a good one. Um, what What is the most objective way to measure success? This is probably a controversial question. Um, and also, I know that people tend to say, oh, for people who have won everything, they tend to say the trophies don't really matter. It's the friends you make along the way. Or it's it's the the little progress and development you do in, in competitions and in rounds and all that. But if you had the freedom to define success for yourself, what would that success mean? I mean, in a world where we reward success with trophies it does come down to winning trophies at least for me um, yeah. but it also comes down to being consistent so i think what makes me feel that i'm a very good debater is not just winning worlds but it's also having yeah. been consistent at being good at tournaments for years uh having yeah. made the open finals of euros having made finals of worlds before so it's not just one tournament where you know i just lucked out and uh, everything went my way and i was all oh, oh, in every round or whatever it's yeah I performed well at multiple different tournaments. Obviously, I'm doing well. Maybe a world where you just evaluate success on pure intellectual merit or whatever would be a nicer world, but we don't live in that world, either in debating yeah. or in academia or anywhere else. So it does come down to whether you have physical proof that you did something well. For me, it's about feeling that it's not just a one-time thing, it's an accidental success, but because I've done well over time in different contexts, I feel that's proof yeah. enough. So I guess trophies per se, but also consistency. That's cool, especially the consistency bit. Because, I mean, I've not won a lot of trophies. I always pride myself in saying I've been in the space for a very long time or I've debated consistently. And I think even for me, people who stay long enough to win, I really, really respect them a lot because there are lots of people who just drop out on the way after one attempt, two attempts, they go like, oh, I'm done. And and yourself, you could have stopped after Thailand and said, well, it, it, it probably didn't work. I've dropped in my performance and that's not good enough. But then you came back in Korea and it was a really, really splendid performance as well. Now let's talk about the financial barriers and probably also the psychological barriers coming from, like you'd say, a place of being an underdog and trying to break into the debating world um, on a global stage. Debate is an expensive sport, to be fair. Um, it's very expensive. Uh, up until COVID, where online competitions became a thing, it was very expensive to access a lot of competitions, worlds, going to these westernized opens or western opens to establish yourself, where more like the elites of the debate world exist for you to try and integrate with them and know exactly what the standards were. How difficult was it for you um, breaking those financial barriers and trying to access debate, going to Thailand, going to Cape Town? 
So I think in that regard, I was relatively lucky to have a couple of different variables overlap for me positively. Yeah. I was able, at least in the early parts of my career, to be able to count on my family to you know, jump in and cover some of the costs. I was a good enough student in college to get a monthly scholarship from the city of Zagreb, which was for a student quite a fair bit of money, which helped me finance you know, my trips. Um, we did have you know, a lucky period just around Cape Town where our society was making a... Making a I mean, we had like more profits and deficits, right? So the society was able yeah. to fund part of it for us. We were able to get some private donors through some connections. So you know, just a couple of different things which combined together gave me the privilege to be able to go to these tournaments. But specifically because if it were maybe 2017 and not 2019, if it were a different context, if you know, just one of those things wasn't there, I know I couldn't. Yeah. I am very much aware that many people, I know you guys as well in your community, but many people struggle with this, with this aspect of, you know, especially before COVID, but, but even now, yeah. like, stuff like Worlds has moved back in person, all sorts are back in person. People struggle with it, able to just be present, just get opportunities in the first place. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just true. Financial limitations are a big thing. Um, I think numbers are also very important when you are trying to, as a small community, trying to break into the world scene the more you are and even beyond the numbers the frequency with which you're able to attend these competitions would be really really helpful i mean you yourself you've had two three worlds experiences and all those experiences came together for you at a at a particular point in time the difficulty with having financial limitations is there are a lot of good speakers who never get to attend worlds more than once or even attend it to begin with and so it becomes a really difficult thing to get the experience and come back and establish yourself and come back and eventually get to the top as well. But what was the most difficult psychological adaptation you had to make? Were there certain mindsets that you had from the start that you really had to sit yourself down, put them aside, then propel yourself to the top? Yeah, I think it was most of the mindset of I'm never actually going to succeed because there's something about me that makes me worse than these people. Uh, maybe I'm just good at yeah. rehashing my partner's matter, but what if I'm not creative? What if there is a particular type of motion I'm never going to be good at? What if my English, although it's good, is never going to be detailed? So you always find something about yourself that gives you reason to doubt. And I think the reason why people do that, why I did that, is because you set yourself up for failure in a way. So how to say this? You are building up a buffer for when you inevitably fail. You are a priori yeah. looking for reasons to explain your failure. So once you fail, it's easier for you. But that takes oh. away from actually building up a winner mentality. And one thing that just stuck with me, and I think a key part of how I changed my mentality. So a couple of months before Novisad Europe, which was the first time I broke with a major, I was talking yeah. to Olya from Zagreb, who's my best friend. You also definitely heard of her. She's like she's a, she's a name in global community yeah. as well. Um, and I was talking about how, you know, I'm really worried that, you know, we're going to not go to in rounds. We're going to fuck up round eight, round nine. We're not going to break. And she was like, oh, but like you and Lovro, you guys want to make ESL finals, right? And I was like, yeah. Uh, but you know that all of the other teams who also want to make the ESL final are not spending the, their time thinking about round nine. They're already thinking about how to be the teams that are going to be in the final. Like you're spending your time and energy yeah. where your opponents are not. So if you want to beat them, you have to think like that. So if you want to beat, you know, Leiden A was very good back then, or Tel Aviv A, you have to be in the mindset of Tel Aviv A, right? You cannot have your cake and eat it. Yeah. That was something that really stuck with me in terms of mentality. Yeah. I mean, the part that really, really is interesting for me is you saying you're sort of stuck in the cycle where you are making pre-existing excuses even before you feel, such that once you feel, you sort of feel less blame on yourself that oh, I, I knew that I wasn't good enough or I knew that I had this flaw or I knew that this really existed. And I think that mindset is one that almost everyone experiences, almost everyone falls prey to at some point in time. But it's really, really good that you spoke about it because we, we still have to put ourselves in a conscious state of mind where we take ourselves out of that, that framework and then do the positive aspect of it, more like putting the work, like you said, to meet our opponents where they are as well. Let's zoom in a little bit more into being an ESL speaker and the strengths and the limitations that come with it. 
What were your most significant struggles as an ESL speaker breaking into the world stage? I think, first of all, it was that when we started, there weren't really that many examples of ESL speakers doing very well. There were a couple. Yeah. So there were, of course, Siri and Helena. There were um, Dan and Ayal. At that point, yeah. Tom Manor and Noam Dahan were, you know, breaking onto onto the scene. Milos and Yankov slowly as well. Um, but yeah. there was just like a dozen or so ESL speakers who were really successful. So I think when I was starting, there was still a lot more stigma um, along the lines of ESL people can never really produce speeches, EPL people can, than there is today. Yeah. I think secondly, yeah. just, although, to be fair, I struggle with this a lot less than most e ESL speakers. I've been told I'm ESL plus. Uh, my English is, on a comparative <laughs> ESL level, quite, quite good, because I've been speaking English fluently since my childhood. Um, but yeah. regardless of the fluency I have, it's still the question of when you are in, in the middle of a speech, I'm still translating from Croatian into English. I still find myself in, in a situation where I can't really find the perfect word. So it first of all yeah. takes away from persuasion, but secondly it takes time. It takes mental energy to have constant, yeah. you know, also translate from Croatian into English. Yeah. Whereas if you're an EPL speaker, it's literally a stream of thought. You think, you speak. Yeah. Whereas for an ESL speaker, is you think you translate to speak. So even if you speak very good English as ESL, you cannot eliminate this middle step. So I think this is the biggest yeah. challenge. This is really fascinating because, I mean, I, I sometimes get caught up there. I've never thought of it as this three-step thing that you just described, which is really, really interesting as well. Um, but do you think, like, what, what value do you think getting a lot of ESL speakers who are really, really successful offers to upcoming ESL speakers? Because you saw that as a challenge sort of when, when you didn't have a lot of people to look up to. I think the most obvious answer is you no longer connect EPL to good. Because now as a as okay. an up-and-coming judge, so, okay. so even if you're Iona, right? So imagine you are you're a young judge from Exeter or Yeovil or Sheffield or wherever in Iona at Oxford and Cambridge. When you look at the tabs yeah. of worlds, you don't see exclusively Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and Princeton up there. You perceive Sophia yeah. to be one of the best institutions of the world. You perceive Tel Aviv, you perceive Belgrade, you perceive Zagreb. So from the beginning of your debate, yeah. whether you're from Iona or not, even if you're from Iona, you don't have the subconscious connection of English as native language means you are good at this activity. Yeah. Which it yeah. even translates to a lot less bias when it comes to judging. Um, I think it just means also a lot more ESL judges, a lot more ESL CEOs yeah. who look out for these things. Yeah. Allocate judges to rooms such that if you have three EPL teams, the ESL team doesn't get screwed over. Um, but I think lastly, yeah. lastly, it's just trailblazers uh, in a world with a lot more Miloshes and Yankos and Rumens and Hadars. Um, there's a lot more people yeah. to look up to as an ESL speaker. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's very true as well. Um, what strengths did you draw on to carve an advantage for yourself? Because I'm sure, for me, for instance, I look at you and I, I try to imagine where the, all these things, things that you learned, were some of them natural strengths of yours. And so what are some of the things that simply came to you as natural strengths of yours that you could draw to carve the kind of speaking advantage that you have for yourself? Yeah, yeah. so I think first of all, it's clarity. I am very clear in delivery. I yeah. am able to frame things in a way that they're easily understandable to other people. I'm able to use yeah. examples and analogies in a very basic and still persuasive way to get my idea across. I think yeah. clarity is one thing. I think I have the ability to generate a lot of matter very quickly, or even if not generate per se, I, I'm, I'm even better than generating in fact, because I'm not, I mean, of all the partners I spoke with, many of them were actually better content generators than me. But I'm yeah. very good at taking the content someone throws at me and making oh. it into a strategic speech. So taking the material okay. and putting it in the, into a tactic, into a framework that makes it win. So when I debated with Ben yeah. Ashnida, who is now Sagra Bay at, 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 at Euros, uh, with Yara yeah. on he once told me that I'm like I, I'm like a delivery machine. So he puts the content into the machine, and the machine produces a speech. And this is why, this is why I always like to speak with speakers who generate all the stuff, who say all the stuff in prep. Yeah. 
was, was when I'm prepping with people. I was like, just throw stuff at me. Throw stuff at me. Yeah. And I'm gonna, you know, divide the good and the bad, you know? Because I think that's a that's strength. I think my final strength is actually that yeah. I'm not too stylistic. I'm not too dramatic. Like, I'm not go so. I'm not gonna do this one minute introduction of how the worlds were shackled by dictatorship of no alternatives, which yeah. helped me adopt one of the best pieces of advice I've gotten, which was from Janko Djordjevic back in the day, which is. Yeah. What you have to make up for if you're an ESL speaker as opposed to an EPL speaker is time. So where Boso is going to do his one minute introduction, yeah. what you're going to do is you're going to have a five second introduction that allows you to jump straight into rebuttal. You're going to say something like, the, Mr. Speaker, yeah. the primary mistake of the opposition side in this debate is and then you move into rebuttal. Or you're going to say something along the lines of this debate yeah. badly needs framing, so I'm going to provide it. You're going to jump directly into framing. So doing introductions that are still, you know, stylistic, still assertive, but they're actually ways to get yeah. speaking actual content in the fifth second, not the 35th, right? Uh, I think because I never had a pension for yeah. style, in the sense I, I don't care for drama too much, um, I was able to adopt this advice quite efficiently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's really, really in line with the way you speak as well, because I can just get flashbacks of, of speeches that you've given, and it just starts with a framing or a direct rebuttal and just jumps right into the content. I think you've mentioned a lot of ESL speakers that you've listened to, looked up to, quite a few that have given you advice. Which of them inspired you the most? Uh, the, the, this is this is no no contest. Dan, Dan, Dan Lahav, definitely Dan Lahav. <laughs> wow. What about I, him? I think, I think first of all, Dan is incredibly adaptable. So I've heard Dan speak in so many different yeah. situations on different motions, um, in situations where there were more reputable teams in Tel Aviv and around. Dan would always find a way yeah. to craft a winning strategy. And even if he would not win, he would have a strategy that has potential to win. So I think, first of all, he's incredibly adaptable. Yeah. Secondly, he has the ability to analyze things in such a non-complex way in terms of there's not much complex terminology, there's not much convoluted analogies. So he speaks very down to earth, yeah. but it's still so persuasive and so deep in terms of analytical quality. But I think it's also the fact that, you know, top speaking worlds at the time when he did, when a lot more yeah. was filed against ESL speakers than today, just an achievement in and of itself. Yeah. Like the guy came into a hostile environment and he kicked everyone's butt. Then that's just incredibly impressive. I also feel he's a fantastic judge. So one of some of the best pieces of feedback I've gotten were from Dan Lahav. And I've mentioned some of them, some of them here. So I just feel like Dan Lahav is so yeah. How do you say versatile? So good at different parts of debating, and he succeeded at the time. Yeah. It was very hard to succeed. Nothing to take away from Ayal. To be fair, Ayal was a phenomenal speaker. I just think Dan is the yeah. goal. For me, Dan is the goal, hands down. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Because I mean, um, you are the second person I'm hearing um, picking Dan on uh, amongst the, the greats that we've seen um, as well. Which brings me back to some of the speeches I've, I've watched of Dan. Really, really amazing stuff. Before we end this part, I just wanted to give maybe a general advice to ESL speakers um, who are trying, working on their own individual strengths. What would you say are general things that ESL speakers should just keep in mind in their journey within the debate space? So I think, first of all, is this piece of advice you mentioned earlier, they got from Yanko. You have to make up for time. Don't yeah. spend too much time on style. Don't spend too much time yeah. on unnecessary rhetoric. So you want to be delivering analysis. Um, the second thing is... Yeah. Don't try to make yourself EPL. If you have a Balkan accent, you have a Balkan accent. If you have any form of accent, you can have any form of accent. You don't you also don't have to be yeah. grammatically precise. You don't have to put the article in the sentence, you know, where, where it's supposed to be. You're allowed you're allowed to use the grammatically wrong form of a word as long as the judge understands the word. So don't focus too much on making yeah. yourself EPL. Speak as if you would if you're drinking a beer with your friends. Because the point is to yeah. get your message across. If you're spending time thinking about how you're sounding, you're not thinking about what you're saying. This detracts from analysis. I think ESL speakers have yeah. some sort of privilege in this community that some of the best speakers around today are ESL, that some of the best institutions are ESL, and that there's a lot of attention being paid to equity for ESL. Yeah. I think... In that environment, ESL speakers should be focusing on improving their knowledge and their analysis, not their style. You will never be a push yeah. guy from Oxford. You need to accept that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, this has been a one-on-one -on -one interview with Tim Pulich. Um, it has been a great conversation so far. We've gone two parts in. 
one more part to go where we talk a little bit much more personal details about Tin and and a few al- iconic speeches that he's given. So stay with us. We'll be back um, with the third part, which will wrap up the interview. So we've been having a one-on-one interview with Tin. Um, it's been enlightening if you followed us right from the start as well. Uh, before we continue with this part, do well to click, like, subscribe to the podcast, share with your friends, and let them follow us for much more in-depth conversations. In this final part, we will just want to go a bit much more personal and uncover your personal experiences and sort of explore what you believe in to be some of your most <coughs> iconic speeches as well um, on your journey to debate. So the first question here is, what did you sacrifice to uplift your circuit? Because there are a lot of people who tend to say they sacrificed a lot of things. I mean, in this conversation, you've already said that because of the love you have for the country, for where you come from, and for the environment around there, you've opted not to leave. Uh, amongst those decisions, what are some of the most significant sacrifices you'd say you've made just to bring up the circuit within Croatia in terms of debating? Okay, I think first of all, it's just a lot of time invested into the circuit. It's yeah. doing coaching sessions weekly. It's giving people personal feedback. It's programming people at tournaments. It's taking your time to you know, craft a training curriculum to not improvise things. It's taking your time to be involved in the society writ large, not just coaching. It's also doing registrations for majors, helping with fundraising, seeing fundraising yeah. tournaments. So it's a lot of time invested into it. I would say, secondly, there's a lot of mental toll involved. First of all, because you feel yeah. personal responsibility. If things go wrong, if, or if people are unsatisfied with training, or if people don't achieve the results they want to achieve, or if just the society isn't running as well as you would like to, you feel as if the responsibility is on your shoulders. But I think it's also, and this is where I, will, I can connect it back to the uh, some of the early comments I made about football and how I take inspiration yeah. from football coaches. There's a lot of man management involved. Like yeah. after trials, if people are unhappy with their partner, and then they all dump their disappointment on you, or if you have to give pep talks before round nine to different yeah. people with different, you know, how to say mental approaches to the game, you have to adapt to people who are very competitive or people who are not that competitive. It's also about um, people having personal things that they bring up to you because you're their yeah. coach, but also because you're their friend. Um, and you have to just keep in mind so many different people's feelings and emotions yeah. and mental states at one time, but you kind of neglect your own in certain instances. Uh, so I think there's also that. But, but ultimately, it, it's not a sacrifice in, a neg- in the negative sense of the word. Yeah. I do choose to stay here off my own will. And I do yeah. think it all pays off when I see my community grow and I see Zagreb continuing to be a relevant institution. But it's definitely yeah. easy. And for anyone who wants to give back to their community, it's not all, you know, flowers and roses. And you just, you know, coach a little bit and they go to majors and they yeah. win. There's a lot of work involved and you have to be aware of that. But it does pay off when you see the fruits of that type. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially the time bit, because it's, it's really, really difficult. And I sort of understand also because I mainly do full-time debate coaching now. I work with a debate organization where I do coaching. And I'm supposed to be making time to contribute to train the Ghana World Schools debate team as well. And sometimes trying to find the time is really difficult, especially with different time zones where I am. And so to see people who constantly dedicate their time, dedicate their efforts, their resources to the development of circuits, being somebody who wants to and sometimes is limited by a lot of factors, I really, really tend to appreciate these kinds of efforts as well. And I'll just say that like Zagreb, Croatia, they're just lucky to have me and, and everyone who is involved in the team up there. And I just wish them all the best as well. But a much more personalized one is you mentioned being in open final in Cape Town and then in Zagreb there was a drop in terms um, in in Thailand sorry there was a drop in terms of the performance did that shock you 
and how did you feel about it? Because I, I tend to feel that would really, really give some form of psychological downtime in terms of you feeling maybe this is the end, maybe there is no more room for me. How did you pick up yourself and just psych up yourself to go again? Here's the thing. I actually don't perceive Thailand as a drop. Because okay. if you take a look at that performance holistically, yeah. Luca and I broke fifth as opposed to Lover and I breaking 12 at Cape Town. Ooh. Luca and I went into the top room in round eight with Oxford, which is Jason Shaw and Lee Wee, Cambridge, yeah. Ian, Ian Wu and Trenton Sewell, and LSE, which was um, Art Mishra and Abhinav Natula. We won yeah. the top room from CG on a shallow motion. We were in the top room wow. rounds eight and nine. Whereas with yeah. Lovro, I was only in the top room in round five. And then whenever yeah. we went up, we would get a third and go back down. And go back down, yeah. We went through Octos, Luca and I, very easily. Oh, it was a hard room. And then went yeah. out of quarters on a up heavy, shallow econ motion after yeah. an hour-long panel discussion. And this was when Ooh. I realized that I was actually a lot better in Thailand in all yeah. of the, I, I was also top ESL speaker in Thailand, and I was not back in back in Kevin. Yeah, so I was better in Thailand in all of the segments except the ultras result. The results, but yeah. Me, but the reason why I went out is arbitrary luck and not a lack of progress. Oh. And I think the, the, the okay. first, what you what you call a drop yeah. actually motivated me to think that if I try again and I just have a little bit more luck. You would win. I can go all the way. And I think it's really connected yeah. back to what I said earlier about how in rounds are a better show of progress than our goals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a really fascinating way to look at it as well. Because, and like you said, maybe a lot of us from the outside would look at it and say, well, that was a drop. But then you evaluate it in a much more detailed way in terms of let's look at my speaker ranking here and there. Let's look at my positioning on top here and there. How did I perform in the top room here and there? Which is really, really interesting as well. Um, and that really shows also that, I mean, Thailand, like you said, obviously now I understand why it wasn't a drop and why it was even probably a much better evaluation of where you've gotten to and, and giving you the motivation to move on in there. But I think we've spoken about your natural advantages and the ones that you draw on. Now let's talk about your most iconic speech. Which speech of yours? Because I personally, I can't select because there are a lot of them that I've heard you give that I think are really, really iconic speeches. If you were to pick one, which is really the difficult task here for you to narrow down to one, what would you say is your most iconic speech? The most iconic speech? Um... Uh, that is a really hard question. Yeah. I think... Hmm. I would probably pick out... Okay, I mean, it's hard to say because I don't know what other people think is iconic. Um, but from yeah. my perspective, I would probably pick Cape Town World's Quarters. Okay. Uh, when we went through from OG. Uh, first of all, because that was our first real breakthrough like you know yeah. getting through the quarters to the semis for me with this mental barrier of you're very good and you're really very good um, yeah because we took out harvard who was one of the favorites to win but also because at least in its modern shape and form this is where i first ran the state power principle Ooh, okay and then continue develop, developing it from there. Yeah. Um, so I think those would be the reasons why I would pick that speech. But I think there are many other that I'm fond of, some of which are not recorded. Yeah. Um, but if I had to pick one, I would pick that one. Okay. So now let's go to specific competitions. So there are, I think, one, two, three, four, five, five competitions here. We'll go through each of them. And then let's look at your most iconic speeches. So first one is Korea WDC. Which of the speeches you delivered do you think is the most iconic in, in Korea WDC? Member of Gov in semis. Because I think it was perhaps the hardest ever situation I found myself in in the debate room. Yeah. Which is, it's re it really is a shallow motion. I don't know, this is a, a call-out to Korea World Safety Team. I don't know why they said around one motion in semis, but fine. Um, Hamza and Taha really matter dumped the shit out of that motion. Yeah. We were left with so little except to do rebuttal and this kind of quirky confucianism extension thingy and we actually managed to pull up an extension from an almost impossible position and yeah. beat 
uh, McGill and Owol, who are a very, very strong team. I don't know if ultimately we won or we took second to OG, doesn't matter. But yeah. I feel as if we pulled off a closing from an almost impossible position, which is why I yeah. prefer that speech in the one in the finals or the one in the quarters. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody... So I was training... I was, I'm was. i training my kids for a competition in the US. And I think they were discussing iconic debaters in the world recently. Your name came up and someone said, ooh, that world semifinal speech. So almost everyone looks at that speech and goes like, that's probably the most iconic. Because... I personally went to watch that speech and I think I saw you replicate a similar strategy in um, I've forgotten the name. There's this competition that we were in open semis and then LSE open. Was it LSE open? I've forgotten the competition really. But you did a similar thing in, in an open semi-final where in OG you were in CU, I think Ateneo were in OO and then Naomi Patnovka and my girl were in CG. And then I went back to watch the semi-final motion. And then I realized there was a similar strategy pulled off. So I started studying it a lot more to see what really is it about and how can I steal bits and pieces of it to improve my game. But that was a really, really iconic performance. Like, that's one of the CGs that you think about. Because today you see a lot of people ultimately not break once they are in CG in out rounds. And to simply do it even regardless of the motion, just break from CG at semi-finals was a really, really hard task. And to do it with such a shallow motion, obviously one of the most iconic speeches. Let's go to Cape Town WDC. Is it still the quarterfinal for you then? Because that turned out to be your, your most iconic when I asked you to pick all of them. Yeah, I think it's that one. I think it's just uh, one of the best PMs I've delivered at a major. I think it's important for me because of at least the way I deliver it, as I said, it was the first iteration of the same power principle. It was yeah. the debate, the one debate that majors, the first debate that majors, where I realized we can actually go all the way, we can beat the best of the best. So I very, yeah. very fondly remember that debate and that speech. Awesome. What about Athens EUDC? Probably the ESL final prime minister, just because I feel in terms of role execution of what the prime minister's speech should be, I think okay. of all my major PM speeches, it was the best in terms of vocal film. Maybe even better in that regard than the Cape Town one. So just okay. think I delivered the closest to what I feel is a technically perfect PM. Yeah. Not necessarily analytically perfect, but I did everything I wanted to do in that speech. I didn't feel anything was missing. I yeah. think my second place would be uh, Open Semis. A member of Gov, just because um, that motion really ties into a lot of the stuff we've historically experienced here in the Balkans, the conflicts and the yeah. wars, and being able to reference a lot of those examples made the speech emotional for me. Yeah, yeah. I would try and see if I would put the links of these speeches in the description when we are publishing the episode, just so that people people could go watch the ones that are available online as well. Um, Thailand WDC then, which which speech is your most iconic? Unfortunately, uh, it's not recorded. It's, it's a round eight speech, yeah. right? It's, 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 again, it's a CG. It's a motion. It's something on the lines of this house prefers the narrative that beauty doesn't matter as opposed to all bodies are beautiful. Oh, which I feel is yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. kind of the same thing. Yeah. And OG were Oxford, Jason and, and Shin, OO, Ian and Trent from Cambridge, CO, um, Art and Abhinav, LSC, and we won from CG. We got a pair of 85s. Ooh. Um, this was another one of the moments where you go into a room, you think you have no chance, you win, and you're like, oh, okay, so yeah. maybe I'm not just, maybe I'm better than just, you know, breaking, making the quarters and going out. Maybe the open final at Cape Town was not just pure luck. I can yeah. obviously win in these rooms. And I genuinely think it, it's another one of those cases where you pull off a CG from a very, very hard position in emotionally yeah. really tough to even grasp in a way. Um, so yeah, I think I would say that speech. Unfortunately, it's not recorded. That's that's awesome. It's just sad that it's not recorded. But I've seen that motion, and I, I also thought they were really, really similar. Quite a tough motion to debate as well. And then the final competition, HWS 2022. What's your most iconic speech from there? I would say the final. That's unfortunately taken down from YouTube, I think. Um, yeah. So I personally have the link, but I'm not allowed to share it publicly. Oh, um, okay. I think of the in-rounds... I would 
probably pick the Prime Minister and call for productivity in round three. Although we okay. got the first and a third in that round, I still yeah. think that was, in terms of emotion where there's a lot of different narratives interacting with each other and you really have to hit the sweet spot in terms of having a nuanced characterization, which is still not self mitigatory I think I was yeah. able to hit that sweet spot to a significant extent, so I really like that speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so we've gone through really iconic speeches as well. I will just basically just go watch some of them. The ones I've not watched so far, I'll go watch them. And this leads us to the final question of, of this discussion, which is which is on your beer count. I know you have you have a, a long beer count that you are on. I don't know whether you are done or whether you are still on it, but tell us about it. Yeah. So first of all, let me actually check because I don't want to. I don't want to lie to you uh, about the actual number we're on. Uh, so let me yeah. just check on my phone. Okay. Um, give me just like thirty seconds. Cool. 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 Yeah. While I'm doing that, um, so the beer list. Oh, okay. I found it. Wait, just a second. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay, we are currently on number 243. Um, yeah, so, so the beer list is something I started with Petar Schneider, who is, as I've already mentioned, he's a soccer debater, also very, very yeah. prominent. ESL finalist of the world, ESL champion of the world, um, also a very close friend of mine. Uh, and just something shortly before COVID, we both realized we have a, you know, a sweet tooth for good beers. And we just thought it would be fun if we kept track of all the different beers we drank together. Yeah. And the, the logic is we have these like holy principles of drinking beer, which I'm not going to go through in detail. But the point is, a beer only counts for the list if we drink it together at the same time. Ooh, okay. And the point is to drink as many different types of beer that we can, different brands yeah. within one brand, like different, like you know, lagers and wise beers and stuff like that. Yeah. And and, and the grind never stops. We're never actually going to be done. So long as there's more beer in the world to drink, the list is going to go on. And we're currently at number 243. We've actually wow. uh, systematized it in Google Sheets. We track uh, the we track the country of origin. Or we track the type of beer. Even actually, wow. at some point, we're thinking of going back through the list, back to the top, and drink all the same beers again, so we can do reviews. And one of the most fun this things is interesting. Is when you go to a tournament, you know, to a different country, you just drink all the yeah. beers because you wanna you wanna fulfill. I think we drank all the commercial beers in Hungary, for example. Wow. <laughs> This this is interesting because I didn't know it was this detailed and this fun <laughs> with with the beer list, but yeah, it's 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 really really been amazing, and I'm sure it also counts for memories um, that you you've you've spent you shared with them as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, any final words um, for for our listeners? Because this brings us to the end of the questions that we have for you, and if there's any final things that you'd like to say, I guess I would just say I mean I hope people have enjoyed listening to this watching this um yeah. i really had a fun time talking to you here it was one of the most fun interviews slash podcasts i've done and, and i've done a few um i really hope that maybe some of the advice that i gave here some of the stuff we talked about will be useful to someone or inspiring to someone um yeah. i would also invite people if people have any questions about debating or if they want to get advice they're always welcome to reach out to me i, I can't guarantee i will always see the message because you yeah. know all inbox and stuff like that but if i do actually perceive your message i will answer and i think in general yeah. um, reaching out to well-known debaters who you like is not that scary they will either yeah. just not be able to send them a message in which case there's no comparative or they'll actually answer um so i guess yeah. i would encourage people to message debaters they look up to um yeah. for advice and stuff like that um yeah i mean if there's going to be any more opportunities like this for discussions podcasts whatever i'd be happy to join in this was really fun. awesome awesome thank you thank you so much um, for joining <laughs> This has been a one-on-one -on -one interview with Tim Pulich, um, world champion, HWS champion, coach as well, um, and ultimate keeper of the beer list. So thank you very much uh, for listening. Thank you do well to subscribe uh, and then share the podcast as well. Thanks, everyone. See you on the next one.